Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what makes a bonsai pot a bonsai pot. And if you are an aspiring bonsai potter, how to avoid some of the common mistakes that we see in sort of amateur bonsai pot making. All right, well, back in 2006, which <laughs> unbelievably is now over 15 years ago, I was more, not a complete beginner, but more of a beginner. And I had access to a kiln at the time and a friend of mine and I would spend some time making bonsai pots. And I already knew enough to uh, avoid some of the sort of shape mistakes, but not enough to really like make refined pots. So what I have here is a pot that I made back in 2006. And so I just want to use it as the first example. Now, for some reason, I got it in my head that I was going to have square holes in the pots instead of round holes. And let me demonstrate to you why square holes are not really as good as round holes. This is the typical staple type thing that is used to fasten screen across the hole of a bonsai pot to keep the particles of soil from falling out. So I make this like kind of staple shape and then I take a piece of screen like this and I put that screen across this hole in order to prevent the soil particles from falling out. Now with this staple, I go through that screen and then I bend over the ends of this on the underside so that the screen can't move. Now with a round pot, the diameter is regular, but with a square, there's actually shorter and longer points. So if this gets rotated, this screen now becomes loose and can move around. And that means that bigger bugs and whatnot, but it's just sort of messy and not ideal. So I would recommend that you stick with round holes, which are easier to make anyway, um, or something similar to a round hole where it's relatively uh, constant around the edges. There's uh, some potters in Europe that actually use like kind of uh, little scalloped kind of rounds. The second thing that this that this pot brings up for me is that there is no real foot so if i set this down here the pot has like a kind of outward moving profile which is pretty much universal in bonsai pots but there's no gaps underneath the underneath here so i'm not looking at any holes like here anywhere around the rim of around the bottom rim of the pot and so that just sort of gives it a really kind of solid look when it's sitting on the table. But from a, from a horticulture standpoint, that's actually somewhat problematic because water in certain conditions could get trapped underneath here and not allow water to, to escape from in the pot. And you can end up with ponding in the pot because of the lack of an air gap under here. So just imagine like a heavy rain or something like that. The third issue that I have with this, and it's probably the reason why I've never actually successfully used this in a bonsai composition, is that the rim of the pot is so narrow that it lacks any sort of a presence. I think that's a little bit more subtle kind of point that that is difficult to really create hard rules around, but in general, bonsai pots have rims, and so the, the sort of narrow, fine top of this pot makes it have sort of a weak character. I, you know, for everything I'm saying, there's probably a pot that looks fantastic that breaks the rules, but these are generalities. And some of the things that I find have made it difficult to use this particular pot. Moving on to another example, these are two pots that come from very different sources. This one is a pot that I commissioned from Thomas and Kathy Arakawa, and this is an old Japanese pot that I picked up while I was in Tokyo a number of years ago. These pots are largely the same style, and the real difference is that this one has a more substantial rim than this one. And 
there's only one hole here. There's no tie holes, but generally speaking, these are roughly the same. But there's some nice differences in the details. This one has a little bit of a curve to it. It looks more like a handmade pot, whereas this looks like maybe a mold was used or it was slabbed together. I think that the difference in the rims here is kind of instructive. And when you have a rim that moves inward from the sides of the pot slightly, it does cause a little bit of a challenge with getting the trees out of the container when you're going to repot them. But it's also one of the two ways that rims are kind of created and is very standard in bonsai pots. So I actually think that this pot would be slightly better if it had a slightly wider rim like this one. And that rim could project slightly out up here like this one does, which you can kind of see on the side and it can project kind of slightly in just to add a little bit of area and presence to this pot. The feet on this pot are really nice and the feet on this pot are also really nice. And I think I'm gonna use a couple of different examples to talk about how feet are really important to the look of a bonsai pot. Nearly all bonsai pots have feet of some sort or another and the only real exceptions are low round pots and if you think of like a duck pot which is an old piece of ceramics typically from china that was used i believe as a as a bowl for duck food or water those will have no feet but generally speaking almost all bonsai pot have feet in this one we have no distinction between the side of the pot and the foot in other words there's no line along here that delineates the, the foot from the side of the pot. There's a distinct cutout here, and when we turn it over, we see that the feet are raised relative to the bottom of the pot. So just like I was uh, demonstrating earlier, there needs to be a space underneath the pot that will allow for tie wires, as well as the wires that are used to attach drainage mesh to the pot. And that's one of the functions of the feet. But really, I think that the function is largely aesthetic or the most important function is aesthetic because we could have no appearance of feet here and still have a recessed bottom that would allow for this sort of operation. This is a pot that I made back in 2006 and you can see that it's a thrown pot and that I cut out the feet now, when I set this down here, there's a distinct line between where the feet are and where the, the side of the pot starts. And that's very common with bonsai pots, that there's some sort of delineation, some sort of kind of line along here. Usually the feet don't come out past the side of the bottom of the pot, or if they do, the feet, typically the feet that do come out past the side of the pot are very small and more kind of like an elegant foot, not a large rim foot, like if you left the majority of this rim and had it come out further. Now, with this pot, there's sort of no real delineation between the, the foot and the body of the pot here. There's sort of a soft delineation there, and then the potter has created a cutout here, which has created four distinct feet. If you throw pots like this and you do cutouts, the cutout should make it so that there look it looks like there are distinct feet. In other words, if this cutout were only half the height of the sort of uh, portion of the side of the pot that is the foot, which is pretty obviously up to about here, then it would give it sort of an odd look. So I would recommend that if you are creating bonsai pots that these cutouts are actually larger than uh, they are in this case. In other words, like instead of it looking like a cutout, that the feet actually look more like distinct feet rather than just sort of the, the left and right side of a cutout. This pot is an example of a uh, creative use of sort of a motif uh, being incorporated into the foot. And this is something that we commonly see in high quality bonsai pots where the opportunity to create a foot is merged with the, op with the creative expression of the potter. And in this case, obviously it's a skull motif. Um, 
so the you know the lower part of the skull's teeth essentially form the foot and then there's been some hand forming here to to make it sort of almost like look <laughs> more more elegant essentially and there's an endless number of ways that you can do this it you know and this is just one example but using your creative expression and and creating some sort of a foot that's not just functional but that also actually adds to the design of the pot is is really an opportunity these two pots demonstrate something that uh is not common but is sort of problematic in bonsai pots and that is that typically we don't want the profile of the pot to trend inward as it goes up and this one is a, a pot that i carved from a block of clay but it's obviously wider here than it is here and in my in all of my experience with bonsai pots i can't tell you why i have this issue with bonsai pots that go that trend inward like that as they move up but it it definitely doesn't work so the the pot should go slightly outward or vertical uh, but slightly outward is typically the trend and so like if i look at my shelf full of bonsai pots almost every single one of them as you go from the foot to the rim is trending slightly outward or dramatically outward now this one was done by someone who i don't even remember their name but i met them at a at a club event many years ago and it was one of the first pots that they ever made so i'm using it as an example and if this person is still a potter i'm sure that they've made some refinements but you can see that that profile is trending inward there's no real rim to it here and he, they've got the cutouts here but uh there's a little bit too much of a foot going on there and i'm going to subject this person to additional criticism because there's a couple more good examples here first this type of hole pattern is very problematic for bonsai and that's because as a bonsai practitioner we want to cover each one of these holes with this screen so all of these sort of medium-sized holes are creating additional labor every time the pot is used and they're not really creating any benefit for the plant from a horticultural perspective. So using one large central hole or two holes in a round pot like this, and then small holes that are just the size, just slightly larger than a tie wire, is really much more beneficial from a usage standpoint than this type of a hole pattern. Another example of something that's wrong here is that there's a slight lip on this hole because the when the clay was wet, the potter has come in and just sort of punched out a hole and that's created a raised area around it that's problematic because it will potentially cause water to pool in this area every time that the plant is is watered and that means that you can sort of for plants that are more sensitive to it you can end up with root rot because of that so avoid having the the edges of the holes raised it's actually better to have them have a slight sort of taper down to the edge of the rim so that the water doesn't get caught on that edge and then lastly the inside of bonsai pots are not glazed so i can't tell you why but it's pretty much universal that you don't want to have glaze on the inside of a bonsai pot now you do want the glaze if you're using glazes on your pot to be on the rim and i would say that you should come down just slightly on the interior of the rim maybe a quarter of an inch or, or slightly more or less depending on the size of the pot but the the interaction of the roots with the glass is is definitely not ideal the roots like more of a rough surface on the inside and again i don't know the horticultural reason for that but it's definitely somewhat universal uh, somewhat universal. <laughs> uh, okay, one more interesting example here, and uh, this has to do with tie wires. So this pot has a very nice profile, and it actually has some sort of elegant, like little feet, which are probably not quite tall enough um, to be able to see. But overall, 
nice glaze, nice shape. Uh, maybe, the, you know, the rim in this case, I think is large enough compared to the size of the pot. It could be just slightly larger. But the issue here is that when I take, so I, I've got my, my staple that I'm making here for the drainage screen again, and I'm taking this um, and I'm gonna go ahead and like I was gonna put a tree into this container, I'm gonna go ahead and stick this through this screen and then I'm gonna stick the screen, the two uh, ends of the staple through that hole. I'm gonna bend them over under here, cut them off with my wire cutters, and I'm gonna put this down on the table. That's a problem because now this, tr this pot is not stable. So what's going on here basically is that the distance between the edge of this hole and the bottom of these feet is not large enough in order for me to use tie wires. And the same thing would happen if I use tie wires across these holes that are, that are specifically designed for ties, is I would create sort of an unstable situation. So as a potter, what I, I really recommend is that you need to have a recess on the bottom of the pot that is at least two millimeters, uh, better, more like three millimeters, because the majority of people who are tying trees into pots will use like a one and a half or two millimeter aluminum wire or like a number 18 copper or 16 copper. The, the point is that make sure that the pot is functional from the standpoint of the tree being tied into it. Uh, and, and so, you don't want your pots to wobble because this will inevitably cause the the tree to fall over in, a, in windy conditions. All right, uh, in my last examples here, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about shapes. And it's really interesting to adapt shapes that you, that you might be using for other types of functional pottery. For example, a coffee cup could be adapted to become a bonsai pot with some you know minor changes there would be no handle uh, you would need to add some some feet but you could basically create something that is essentially the the same sort of process as as a, a mug but it's also easy when you are used to making certain shapes to create shapes that really are dysfunctional from a bonsai standpoint and this is a good example. So I would imagine that this is probably originally made to be like a sake cup. And then um, someone gave it to me and, and they had drilled a hole in it. And it, it doesn't work as a bonsai pot for a number of reasons. One is that the shape makes it look like a sake cup or, or something else. It doesn't look like a bonsai pot. And part of that is what I mentioned earlier, it's tapering inward. Now that inward taper in this case is, is more dramatic and essentially, after having put a, a tree in this, if I waited a year or two and then tried to get the tree back out, because this portion of the pot is significantly larger than this portion of the pot, I would have to cut off the majority of the roots and it's gonna be really hard to get a tool in there in order to do that. And so it just becomes a very difficult pot to use from a horticulture standpoint. It also has no feet and um, the rim is sort of looks like it was made to to be used for sipping or something like that. So when you're when you're creating shapes, you you need to think about whether or not the shape that you're creating really reads as something other than a bonsai pot. Now, this is a successful example of adapting something to a bonsai pot use when typically it would be thought of more as like a teacup or whatnot. So it's slightly wider than a teacup, but it has the same general shape. And then I think the thing that makes this successful, even though it's coming in here, is that there's this sort of shadow line that's created by the, by the inward motion of the, of the foot here, or as we approach the bottom of the pot and the foot. And as you can see, it has like a solid, uh, solid, rim down here just like a cup would have, but then there's a cutout. Uh, additionally, there's you know a single drainage hole and two, two tie holes, even though it's a relatively small pot. So I actually find this to be a really interesting and successful bonsai pot, even though it has that look. 
And it's really down to the very fine details about whether or not uh, it reads. And one, and I think one way this reads as a bonsai pot or something other than a teacup is that I don't think you would ever want to put your lips on this particular glaze because it's kind of rough. Um, so think about those things as you are making bonsai pots. If you're a bonsai potter and you want to share your work with us, uh, feel free to drop us an email and um, share some of your tips and techniques in the comments below. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you learned something from it. And here's to seeing a lot of great bonsai pottery moving forward in the United States and elsewhere.